So I wanted to do something different today and look at three high yielding dividend stocks that are currently down a considerably large amount. And these are all completely different companies, completely different stocks. And they are stocks that I get asked about on a very frequent basis. So today I want to share my opinion on all three of them. Of course, many people would consider these absolutely falling knives. So please do your own extensive research before making any kind of decision. And just keep in mind that I'm not recommending anything. I'm not telling you to make any decisions. Uh, but if you do enjoy this video, please consider hitting the like button. It also lets me know that you want to see more dividend related videos in the future. But with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. What's up everybody? My name is Ala and welcome to my world of stocks. All right, so starting with stock number one, we've got Ford, ticker symbol F. And this is obviously a very iconic car company that has been struggling quite a bit in recent history. Taking a look at their stock, we can see that they are down really big in the past five years at over 40%. And despite having a great start to the year, climbing by around 15% in 2019, they are still down over 27% from their 52 week high of around $12 a share to now trading for just around the $8 range. This has however led to a cheaper valuation with a trailing PE of less than 10, a forward PE of less than seven, a PEG ratio of less than two, an extremely low PS ratio of just 0.2, and a PB of less than one. Turning to their dividend, we can see that they have a very attractive yield that is approaching 7%, with a reasonable payout ratio of less than 50%, almost a double digit five year growth rate and seven years of consecutive growth. So why has the stock been falling? Well, auto sales growth has slowed down significantly in recent years. If we look at just the United States on its own, we had a very large rally following the last recession, but for the past few years, auto sales have plateaued a bit and investors are worried that we've now reached the end of the cycle. I would also argue that Ford hasn't innovated nearly enough to warrant any major growth in sales. In fact, if we look at wholesale deliveries, which is basically cars sold to their dealerships, Ford saw a decline in their wholesales every single year in North America from 2015 to 2018, and that's not a good sign considering that the US is currently their biggest market. But even if we look at some other important markets, the numbers don't really improve by much. When looking at Europe, Ford did see some strong performance in 2017, but then shot right back down to their 2015 levels last year. And if we look at China, which is the biggest automotive market in the world, Ford plateaued early on and then dropped significantly last year to sell less than a million vehicles. To be fair, the recent drops can absolutely be blamed on macroeconomic conditions that Ford has really no control over, but it doesn't change the fact that Ford desperately needs to innovate and refresh their products if they want to stay relevant in a world where something like Tesla is seeing explosive growth while Ford just keeps lagging behind. For comparison, here's Tesla's vehicle deliveries by quarter during roughly the same time period, and the difference is extremely obvious. But to be fair, once again, the electric vehicle market is also a different monster on its own, since it is expected to grow from $118 billion in 2017 to over half a trillion by 2025 at a compound annual growth rate of over 22%. So clearly Ford needs to do something to take advantage of this growing market. Well, thankfully, it looks like Ford has finally decided to make some drastic changes. First off, they're restructuring 90% of their North American vehicle lineup to consist primarily of more popular, higher margin sport utility vehicles, crossovers, trucks, and commercial vehicles, all by 2020. In the US alone, 75% of their lineup will be refreshed within the next couple of years. To tackle the electric vehicle market, Ford is also investing $11 billion to electrify their best-selling vehicles, including an all-electric Mustang-inspired SUV due out sometime next year, and that one's been building up a lot of hype. Uh, and they're also working on an electric F-150 truck, which is a very, uh, very popular truck, if not like the, the most popular truck. 
Of course, autonomous functionalities are also the future of the automotive industry. So Ford is investing $4 billion through 2030 on autonomous technologies, including 1 billion on artificial intelligence. They're also transforming the Michigan Central Station into a campus for research and development to work specifically on autonomous driving, electrification, and a transportation operating system that I assume will be part of their smart mobility segment that focuses on investing in self-driving cars, ride sharing, shuttle services, intelligent roads, and multi-mode transportation. Intelligent services in the automotive market could be highly lucrative in the future and help bring some recurring revenues for Ford. They're also planning to release 30 new Ford and Lincoln vehicles in China within the next few years to help turn things around there as well. And before we move on to the second stock, I'll just quickly add that despite the slowdown in vehicle sales, Ford has still managed to grow their revenues every single year for the past four years, bringing in over $160 billion just last year alone. Net income, however, has been kind of all over the place, but at least remained positive by billions of dollars. Still, adjusted EPS in 2018 fell by 48 cents, adjusted operating cash flow fell by $1.4 billion, and gap operating uh, cash flow fell by over $3 billion, but was still pretty high at over $15 billion for the year. Perhaps an even bigger concern though is their balance sheet, as they do have about $115 billion in current assets, which don't get me wrong, is very high, but they also have nearly $200 billion in debt. And that's not a pretty picture as fear of the next US recession continues to grow. So overall, I'd say that Ford is a very interesting stock to watch, but until they release a full lineup of some electrified vehicles with some autonomous functionality, you know, as, a, as more of a growth investor, it's just kind of hard for me to get behind them. Now a value investor might see some value in them given the cheap valuation right now and also given that high dividend, but when you consider the risk of a you know of a recession happening within the next few years coupled with that really weak balance sheet and the fact that Ford's vehicle sales are essentially plateauing at best, uh, you know, Ford actually remains a little bit of a risky stock. So you know, Ford is one of those stocks that I often hear people say, you know, is it a value stock or is it a value trap? And it's kind of hard to decide for me personally, but it remains an interesting stock to watch. I'm not invested in it, but let me know if any of you are. I'd love to read your comments down below. All right, guys, moving on to stock number two, we've got CenturyLink, ticker symbol CTL. And this is another very popular stock that I get asked about on a very frequent basis, but they're mostly a telecom, mostly a wireline telecom and uh, internet services based company. They have a very large fiber optic uh, infrastructure or network that they use to their advantage. And uh, I would argue that they're probably a little bit more diversified than people give them credit for. They do some other work with like uh, the data center and they, they do a lot of stuff with like cybersecurity as well. But at the end of the day, they're mostly a wireline telecom and internet uh, services based company. Now taking a look at their stock, they are down over 60% in the past five years at a time when many stocks have actually skyrocketed, uh, but they are also down by over 40% in the past six months, down over 20% in 2019 alone, and are also down over 50% from their 52 week high of over $24 a share to now trading for less than $12 per share. Of course, this massive drop has led to a much more attractive valuation and dividend, where they currently sit at a forward PE ratio of less than 10, a PEG of less than one, and a PS and PB ratio of just around 0.5 and 0.6 respectively, which is generally considered very cheap. You may however notice that they don't have a trailing PE because of the lack of gap profitability in the past year, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Moving on to their dividend, they sit at a very high forward yield of over 8%, but that's really where the positive news stops because their payout ratio is extremely high at over 170% of gap earnings, although it's only about 25% of adjusted free cash flow, but it also has zero growth since it was actually cut by more than half in their last quarter, and that was was obviously a big deal that uh, definitely damaged their stock by a large amount as investors were worried that the company may actually continue to cut their dividend in the future. Still, the fact remains that this is a dividend that has been paid out at very high levels for many years, and their adjusted cash flow of billions of dollars has convinced bulls that the still very high dividend of over 8% is fully sustainable for at least a few years to come. But when looking at the reasons why the stock has been crashing and why the dividend has been cut, that mostly has to do with the struggling 
enabling legacy side of their business like their wireline services. And while CTL has one of the biggest wireline infrastructures in the world, with fiber optics even offering very high speed internet, we're still seeing a gradual transition away from wireline and shifting towards more modern wireless services. There's also added risk from the eventual launch of 5G technologies that CTL isn't really taking advantage of. Having said that, I personally think that there will still be a great need for traditional wireline services, especially for internet access in the enterprise market, because it usually offers better speeds, more reliability, and greater security, all things that CenturyLink is heavily focused on. Don't forget that around 75% of CenturyLink's revenue actually comes from their enterprise sales rather than general consumers, which is what companies like Verizon or AT&T focus more heavily on. And at the moment, CenturyLink is still the second largest US communications provider to global enterprise customers, and they do business in over 60 different countries. So even if they fail to grow much in the future, I think there's still potential for them to be a buyout candidate for their huge infrastructure. But as more of a growth investor myself, I just can't get behind a company that has had such poor performance in recent history. On a pro forma basis, including their acquisition of level three communications, their total revenue for 2018 dropped by almost 3% with literally every single one of their six different segments seeing a year over year decrease in revenue. That's not a good sign. If you're a growth investor looking for some kind of light at the end of the tunnel, uh, you know, it makes it really hard to pull the trigger on a company who can't even pull in revenue growth from six different segments. That's a clear sign that your core business model just isn't working. On the bright side, the acquisition of level three has dramatically helped their free cash flow as that more than doubled to almost $4 billion. And while gap net income still dropped from positive 1.5 billion the year prior to now negative 1.7 billion, I think that the combination of free cash flow generated from the synergies of the combined business with the dividend cut of over 50 percent will dramatically help them not only sustain that high dividend in the future but also provide them with plenty of cash to reinvest in their business and perhaps even more importantly pay down some of their enormous debt which by the way their current assets of 3.8 billion dollars is completely eclipsed by the massive 40 billion dollars of debt so even though i think that there are some positives with centurylink like the fact that they're generating a lot of cash flow uh, and they cut that dividend, which will add even more cash that you know they can play around with. And the fact that they're focusing more heavily on the enterprise market, which is really where I could possibly see some growth in the future as the world becomes more globalized and business continues to increase. That's where I could see some, uh, some positives or some potential growth in the future for them. I just can't get behind a company who has such a poor balance sheet and is still struggling to grow. Until I really see some positive signs, I wouldn't be able to jump behind a company like this. And again, I don't like to keep saying the word recession because I'm not someone who tries to time the market. It's not something that I believe in. But you know, investing in a company that has a healthy balance sheet, that is healthy, that is doing the right things, and that is having some growth, those are all things that are very important to me. So. Uh, you know, just kind of ignoring the fact that, that so many people think a recession is right around the corner, even if I ignore that, I still just can't get behind them until I see some positive signs, until I see some growth, and until I see them deleverage that, that uh, you know, pretty bad balance sheet. Uh, that's when I could really start to consider them more as a long-term investment. All right, guys, last but not least, we've got Kraft Heinz, ticker symbol KHC. And they recently cut their dividend by 36%, but even with that dividend cut, uh, the dividend is still actually pretty high, but the stock has been getting hammered. Now, in the past five years, they're down pretty big at almost 60%, and zooming into the past six months, they've dropped by over 40% after a horrible drop in February that left them down over 30% in that single month alone. They're also down over 24% in 2019 and have dropped by over 50% from their 52-week high of almost $65 a share to now trading for just around $32 per share at the time of this recording. The drop has also led to a cheaper valuation with a forward PE of just 11 and a PB ratio of less than one. Still, their trailing PE is not listed because of negative gap earnings, and even their PEG ratio comes in at negative five because some analysts apparently on uh, Yahoo Finance are expecting earnings to decline in the future as well. Of course, that doesn't mean that those analysts will be right, but it's still a concern to be aware of. On the bright side, their dividend is still very attractive despite the recent cut, 
cut as they sport a forward yield of almost 5%. Unfortunately, the other metrics aren't as pretty as their payout ratio sits north of 65% and they now have zero years of growth due to that dividend cut. So what exactly led to that drastic decision? Well, the consumer transition away from junk food along with the war on sugar, GMOs, and harmful preservatives to more health conscious options coupled with Kraft Heinz inability to innovate or drastically improve their products has led to a massive slowdown in sales and poor performance overall. Keep in mind that Kraft is primarily owned by a company called 3G and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and many feel that 3G has forced Kraft Heinz to focus more on cost cutting and profitability rather than reinvesting in the business for future growth and innovation. Here's a revenue chart of their past four years and you can see that they've been relatively flexible for the past two years and while they still generated some pretty large sales of over 26 billion dollars it's still less than what they did in 2016. Gap net income was looking even worse as it went from negative in 2015 to positive in 2016 and 2017 just to go negative again in 2018 losing over 10 billion dollars thanks to a huge write down of 15 billion dollars mostly related to their Kraft and Oscar Mayer trademarks, meaning that their business is believed to be worth much less now than previously thought. Speaking of the write down, this meant that Gap EPS for their last quarter was down over 250% year over year, with even non-Gap EPS still dropping by almost 7% year over year, which missed analyst estimates by over 10%. On the bright side, sales did increase if only by less than 1%, but organic growth was a little better at 2.4%. And if you thought their performance was the only issue, then you may also want to take a look at their balance sheet where they sit at $9 billion in current assets but over $7 billion in current liabilities and over $30 billion in long-term debt. Not exactly a pretty picture when you consider the need to invest in future innovations and growth initiatives. Speaking of which, management is hoping to turn things around in the future by taking the write-down hit now to improve their future EPS numbers and the 36% cut to their dividend should help them deleverage in the future given that they generated around $11 billion of profit in 2017 alone. So this is a company that can generate profit, they just need to get their act together. Now their dividend payout ratio is also lower at just 43% when looking at adjusted earnings. So if they can make some strategic moves to fuel some small growth and get their overall business under control, there may be some potential upside in the future. And while shifting consumer trends remain a huge concern, Kraft has at least tried to diversify recently with a couple notable acquisitions being Ethical Bean and Primal Kitchen, both of which I mentioned in my full analysis of the company a little while back. Ethical Bean was acquired just last year and they're known for their environmentally friendly business as is evidenced in their eco-friendly coffee pods that fully break down versus other plastic brands that do not fully break down. Anyway, Primal Kitchen is another interesting acquisition that uh, Kraft Heinz made. And this one, uh, this is a company that offers a range of condiments that are paleo friendly, which if you've never heard of the paleo diet, it's, it's like a new trendy diet that is focused on eating real foods that are mostly based on our ancestors' diets that were hunters and gatherers, generally making it healthier than all the processed junk that we eat today. Of course, this is just a place to start, but it's a good place to start. And I think that Kraft does have the right idea in mind to make some of these kind of moves. The only thing that I'm, you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the balance sheet, I would probably be investing in Kraft Heinz myself. But the issue that I see is that they're probably going to need to make some more of these kind of small acquisitions to, to help them have uh, some more future growth. And that's going to add debt to the balance sheet. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation. On the other hand, you know, if they can live with that debt for a little while longer and they can grow the business and they can return to some of their previous profitability levels, which I have no doubt in my mind that they can do. Uh, then, you know, I, I don't think it's that big of a concern and then maybe it turns into a good long-term investment. But for me personally, I wouldn't invest in them until I see them really start to turn things around and really return to growth. Again, I'm a little biased because I'm more of a growth investor. So Kraft Heinz doesn't really fit my kind of investing style but it's still an interesting stock to watch uh, nonetheless. Oh, and one last thing I forgot to mention is the rising competition of private label brands. That's where you'll, you'll have companies like Walmart or Albertsons or Stater Brothers. They'll pay like a third party company to make some grocery products for them. And then they'll kind of stick their own branding on them. And uh, those usually sell for a lot cheaper price than something like Kraft Heinz. And so that's a little bit of a competition there as well. If Kraft Heinz can get 
quality more on their side if, if they uh, if they go more of the quality route which is kind of evidence in acquisitions like ethical bean primal kitchen those are more kind of quality brands if they have quality on their side then i could see consumers still picking up Kraft Heinz products but if that's not the case uh, you know, a lot of times these private label brands have similar quality and they're actually a lot cheaper. And so that's kind of another concern as well. I actually had some people leave comments in my, in my last video on Kraft Heinz and they said that they will never buy a bottle of ketchup unless it's Heinz ketchup. They'll never buy mayonnaise unless it's Kraft mayonnaise. And I don't know, I thought that was kind of funny, but I guess there are people out there who really, really like Kraft Heinz products. So, um, I don't know. I'm not one of them, but, but, uh, but apparently there are people like that and I, I definitely have respect for them. So anyway, that's uh, I think that's just going to do it for the video. If you have any questions, comments, leave them down below. If you're invested in any of these stocks, let me know down below. And if you guys want me to talk about specific stocks or even some dividend stocks, things like that, make sure you let me know in the comments section because a lot of times I pick the stocks that I'm going to talk about in my videos. I pick them from the comment section from what you guys want to see. So make sure you let me know whenever there's stocks. But please try to make it stocks that at least some people know about them because sometimes people will just like throw out like a really random weird stock that or weird company that is performing horribly bad. And, uh, and, they, and they like beg me to talk about it. And I'm like, it's just, if I make that video, it'll get zero views. Nobody will care about it. But um, anyway, that, <laughs> I think I'm rambling on. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.